Thank you very much, Rose. I would like you to take a place on the podium and maybe we can discuss a little bit and answer some questions. Please find a chair over there and foreign minister. And I hope you are now ready to um, send me some SMS questions. I need to have my cell phone then <laughs> to read them. Uh, but I think I would like to kick off uh, with uh, some questions before I read my, uh, on my phone. Uh, I think that um, we have to speak about the INF Treaty. <laughs> you being... <It's> <laughs> You being an arms control uh, um, expert and been involved in this uh, during most of your career, uh, do you foresee a new arms race in Europe? What does this uh, agreement mean both for European security and uh, the United States? Well, first and foremost, uh, many of you know that I've been working on this issue uh, since the Obama administration. The Trump administration has been uh, very clear in underscoring the amount of diplomacy that the United States has applied uh, to trying to get the Russians to deal with this violation of the INF Treaty. So I've been working the issue since, uh, since May of 2013, a long, long time. And in all that time, the Russians have been unwilling to uh, work with us seriously to confront uh, this issue. And so I have personally been very concerned that the Russians are hollowing out the INF Treaty from inside. And so it's very important to recollect that a treaty that is only being respected by one party is no longer providing for security. And that is a, a message that the allies have, uh, have truly understood. We've been very grateful uh, at the way they have understood and uh, comprehended uh, the challenge uh, that this uh, Russian action faces uh, or Im imposes on the international system. But that said, I don't uh, see the necessity of an arms race uh, by any means. For one thing, this new Russian capability is uh, one of a number of capabilities. They are modernizing their forces. We need to keep a sharp eye on that. We need to be very, very astute in reckoning what we require for our own deterrence and defense. Uh, but we, I'm sure, will do so in a judicious manner because, frankly, allies have a lot that they need to spend their resources on, their, their very, uh, I would say, precious defense resources, and it's not on an arms race involving intermediate-range missiles. And for Russia, um, Ina already mentioned the uh, extent to which they are overstretched in their uh, defense establishment as well. It was interesting over the weekend to take note that President Putin went on record saying that he was very keen any so-called response to U.S. Uh, violations should, uh, should be uh, taken out of the existing defense budget, that there would be no new resources. <laughs> I think, frankly, they've already budgeted for all this stuff. So uh, anyway, he talked about a couple systems in addition to the 9M729, the caliber, for example, the, the naval missile. But to my mind, they've already budgeted uh, for what they're going to do with that, that program. I will be glad to discuss this issue further as per the interest of of those in the audience, but I really wanted to stress at the outset that I do not see that we are on the cusp of a new arms race here. Mm -hmm. And uh, many analysts have also argued that this is, it has outlived itself because it's just about Russia and uh, the United States is a relic somehow from the uh, Cold War, the treaty, um, particularly when we think about China and other nuclear powers. Do you see in the future any possibility that you can get a broader group of countries uh, into uh, something similar as this treaty? Yes, Ina spoke earlier about the necessity for strategic patience among the allies, and I see the necessity also for strategic patience as we confront the future of uh, constraints and restraint involving intermediate range ground launch systems. The strategic stability fact remains that these systems are highly accurate and they are fast flyers. 
and so they posed the same problem that they posed in the 1980s, fast flight time to target giving little warning to uh, the country under attack. And so uh, the, the um, threat of what we call a decapitating first strike emanating from these systems is serious, and it remains serious, but it remains serious for all countries who are deploying these systems, and if there is a proliferation, and there has been a proliferation across Eurasia, you mentioned China, also the South Asian countries, DPRK, Iran just announced over this weekend that it was deploying a new intermediate range system. So all must confront the threat uh, that these kinds of missiles pose. This is a strategic stability issue, and so frankly, I welcome a phase of serious stability discussions now among all interested parties with the notion that over time there will be a, a recognition of uh, the, the importance of some form of restraint with regard to these systems. So I am not at all pessimistic about the future, but I do think it will require patience, it will require time, and it will require engagement to have some, uh, some really meaty discussion on what the implications of, of these systems are for all countries involved. Thank you. Foreign Minister. Uh, well, there's really not much to add when Rose has spoken about this because I think she's one of the people in the world who knows most about the INF Treaty and, and, our, <laughs> yes, and arms control regimes. But I just want to add just a couple of points, and that is that uh, I, I got asked several times uh, during the last week about exactly what Rose is pointing to. Will we now see a new arms race? And I fully agree with Rose that, that I don't think we will. And one of the reasons for that is that the INF Treaty is, even though important, it's only one piece in a bigger puzzle uh, when it comes to uh, arms control. Having said that, the arms control regime as such is also under pressure. And one of my concerns now is what will happen with the New START Treaty when it expires in 21. Will it be prolonged for five years as we all hope, or will it not? So I think that we should use this, um, I would say, the the impasse that has happened to also have a good discussion about the arms control regime as such. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure that we have agreements, we need to make sure that we do not pull out of everything even though the INF Treaty now seems to be coming uh, to an end. Six months will pass uh, and in those six months uh, both Russia and the U.S. will have to act as if the treaty was still um, was still valid. Uh, they do not have the opportunity to uh, do things that are in violation of the treaty. But of course, what we have seen over the past years is repeatedly that the Russians have not complied with with the treaty. And over time, I mean, it's it, I think it's very reg regrettable that the treaty now seems to to end. But over time, you cannot uphold a treaty between two parties where only the one party upholds it. And ever since 2014, the U.S. has kept NATO allies informed about Russian breaches of the treaty. Uh, so this is nothing new, nothing new, and I think that the diplomatic efforts that has been done by the U.S. in these years has really been commendable, but unfortunately, it hasn't right. helped. Ina. Being a former defense minister and a foreign minister, I have to ask you the 2% question. Rose said that Norway is the only country bordering Russia that not used 2% of GDP to defense. And you said that burden sharing is the most important way to keep US commitments to Europe. Will Norway um, deliver in 2025? Well, as I said, burden sharing is actually one of the cornerstones in the discussions that we're having in the alliance now. And it's not, and, and I think this is important to underline, this is not about Donald Trump, because these discussions started long before him. Yeah. I've been hearing these discussions for as long as I've been engaged in security and defense policies, as long as I've been going to the U.S., having meetings with senators and, and representatives. This has been on the agenda for a very long time, and it is needed because defense spending were going in the wrong direction uh, between all allies. And I think that it's about time that we have a good discussion on this and that we have goals and targets that we adhere to. And as every other country, we, we also do. Uh, we have increased our defense spending substantially. And I, I, in my opinion, it has been absolutely necessary because we were 
at a place where defense spending was not taken seriously enough because we had, of course, also other things that needed to be dealt with. But given the state of insecurity around us and our security policy neighborhood, uh, it was really necessary to do. And that is why we've been pushing upwards and will continue to do so. Having said that, I think it is also extremely important that this burden-sharing discussion is not only about a 2% target, it is about covering the needs of NATO, covering the needs of the individual country. And when we talk about this in a NATO context, I think most countries agree to this. And, and the reason I mention that is, from our perspective, when we invest, as I mentioned, in high-end capabilities, that are both deployable and interoperable. We're not only doing it for ourselves, we are doing it to strengthen the alliance, but we're also doing it to make sure that we have a stronger uh, armed forces and defense uh, in Norway. So I think that from, from the angle of the individual country, from the angle of NATO, it is important that we're not reducing this only to a a uh, discussion of a percent target, but also a discussion of how we spend money and why we do it, mm. because we have to uphold this. Mm. We, we can't come to 2025 and then suddenly everyone loses uh, the interest or, or the momentum. We have to keep going, mm. because we're making investments now that will demand a lot of money to uphold mm. and to run. I mean, when we invest in new F-35s, we can't ground them in 2025. We have to keep the budgets going so that we can fly them. Mm as one example. And then comes new technology. We don't know how the world looks in 2024, 2025. Um, Rose, you, you mentioned the story with your father uh, seeing Sputnik on the sky uh, in 58, I guess. 57. 57, yeah. Um, how do you see uh, the challenge, the interplay between technology and geopolitics when it comes to uh, the relation between states in the international system, but also technology kicking into our political systems, uh, making uh, democracy more vulnerable because we have different ways of communicating. Uh, the political dialogue is not longer just among party members. It's, you know, on Facebook, social media. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like you to reflect a bit on the interplay between uh, technology geopolitics and internal politics, please. Clearly you will have two days to <laughs> wrestle with this question, but I will do my best. I will give you some of my opinion on this matter. And, and the first uh, thing I do want to underscore is a point that I made in my address. Let's not only focus on the challenges but also on the opportunities. I frequently get asked, for example, it's the question about a new Cold War, question about a new Cuban Missile Crisis, and I say, look, Look at the differences in communications between the early 60s and today. Today, you know, okay, you may think it's a bad thing that leaders can text each other or that national security advisors can text each other, but I like to use that as an example of where we have so many more lines of communication open and so many more layers. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, the White House was, they had to fall back on the excellent Soviet ambassador at that time, Dobrynin, of course, but also they had to seek out the task correspondent in Washington because they were trying to get some messages through to the Kremlin and they didn't have any other way that they could figure out to go about it. Now, of course, that led to the famous Line, but that itself was a technological innovation and provided an opportunity for furthering peace, security, predictability, and in the end of the day, mutual understanding between Moscow and Washington. So I, I like to use that as an example. One of the issues, though, we have to confront, I think, in thinking through this is now it's essentially a free-for-all. It's an unregulated kind of, of communication. It's not only President Trump who likes to tweet things publicly, but I've noticed there's quite a bit of that going on around the U European Union these days <laughs> and between London and Brussels. So, you know, it's, it's all over the world. It's a reality, the situation today. But how do we think about policymaking when there is more of a free-for-all 
in uh, the debate and discussion between and among uh, policymakers. I haven't been able, I think, to sort through these issues adequately myself, but I do think it requires a degree of experience and deafness in considering when to make use of more public means of communication and when to keep it, uh, when to keep it quiet. I think from time immemorial, leaders have communicated through the media, through the press, so let's just think about you know, what makes sense for achieving pragmatic and practical goals. So that's one example, um, and I'll leave you with it, that I think we need to consider the challenges, yes, but also look to the opportunities, but then also think about, um, I don't want to say regulation because people think, ah, you just want to put in new rules you know, that will co entirely constrain. No, I think thinking about um, some ways to introduce predictability into how these tools are used and also to ensure that the rule of law is upheld, the rights of individuals, for example, the rights to privacy are upheld. How, how, do, we, how do we essentially weave that in without placing undue constraints? So those are some of the thoughts I would have as you embark on your debates in the next two days. Thank you. And then, and then not to be on the pessimistic side, uh, <laughs> but I would, I would add one um, challenge that I think could be um, interesting to discuss. One of the things that we see is right now the combination of, as Rose says, the free-for-all, everyone can put information out, anyone can relate to that information in however way they want to. The challenge is that it happens simultaneously as we see an erosion of trust in institutions, which means that what a government says is no longer necessarily something that people believe in. Uh, that also opens up a whole new space for misinformation uh, that is very often deliberately put out there. And the reason it is done that way is very often to cast doubt into decision-making processes. And we can use NATO as an example. What constitutes an Article 5 situation? Are we below or over the threshold of an Article 5 situation? it can, in some instances, be very, very difficult to decide. And to make the most of the insecurity in such a discussion, that will also have to happen very fast. You could easily see that those actors, those adversaries, who would like to, in a way, alter the course of, of history with very simple, often free means, can do that without taking a lot of either political or military risk. And I think it's, it's something that is worth reflecting on and, and thinking about in, I mean, when we discuss things in NATO, but also, uh, also more generally, because the use of hybrid means is absolutely nothing new. It's been used in, in all wars and all societies ever since the beginning of time, but it takes a bit of a new shape right now. The new and interesting part, however, is that usually it was used for the means of the inferior part in a potential conflict because they had no other means. Now it is always often also used by the superior part in a conflict. And that is something that in a way changes a bit of the equation here. It makes it more difficult to make sure that the information that gets out is the correct one, that people have mm. trust in institutions and, and their way of, I mean, conveying uh, a truth. And as long as even truths are portrayed as fake and fake news, it's increasingly difficult. It's dangerous. Mm. It is difficult indeed. Um, I've got a lot of SMS questions now. I think I will turn to give the audience a chance to get answers to their questions. Uh, one here goes maybe for both of you. NATO is said to be an alliance of values, not just security. Today, with increased polarization, what are the core values shared by the Allies? And both of you, I think, touch a little bit upon it in your speeches that it's different kind of democracies, I think you said, Rose, that are in this alliance. And we have, of course, some allied countries um, developing maybe in a more um, pessimistic way when it comes to respecting rule of law and democratic uh, rights as freedom of speech. What are the core values that we share? 
That's an Start easy one. That's an easy one from my <laughs> perspective because the core values are inscribed in the Washington Treaty, which we will be celebrating on the 4th of April, mm -hmm. 70 years to the day from when it was first signed. So the core values are clear and succinct. They are spelled out in the treaty. If you haven't read it lately, I uh, commend it to you. Unlike things like the New START Treaty, which were over 400 pages long, the Washington <laughs> Treaty is just a couple pages long and it's well worth reading because it does focus on the core values as well as the basic uh, organization of, of the alliance and particularly built around Article 5 our famous all for one and one for all article. Mm -hmm. Now, lots of questions have been raised recently about uh, the different directions that, that uh, democracies are taking mm -hmm. here in Europe. I want to stress that um, inside the NATO institution, on a day in, day out value, uh, on a day in, day out uh, basis, all of those values are brought to play again and again in how we organize our work. So even if capitals are engaged in particular direction or particular debate, NATO itself is unrelenting about advancing those values every day in, again, how we organize an exercise like Trident Juncture, thinking about the interests of local communities and how they interact with uh, our troops on the ground, thinking about the rights of civilians in some of our other missions in Afghanistan, and how we, uh, how we plan how we organize uh, and how we carry out our day-to-day -day business. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not perhaps a, a, a perfect answer in terms of how we interact with capitals because uh, you know capitals have their own political dynamics at work. But I am confident that from the perspective of the NATO institution, we drive the message about the necessity of upholding those core values day in, day out with uh, each and every NATO ally. So I am very confident about that, and we hope that they have a beneficial influence uh, you know, on a day in, day out basis as well for the countries involved. And I, I think it's interesting to see what happened during the NATO summit last year. Um, it was, of course, um, some turbulence on the, on the outside. But the fact of the matter is that that was maybe the most productive and the most substantial NATO summit for the past 25 years. The decisions that were made, and, and Rose alluded to the around 100 different decisions that were made, actually pushing the alliance in a very good direction. Uh, undertaking reforms that we haven't seen for, for many, many years uh, taking place in NATO. We could never have done that had it not been for those values that were, after all, were kind of pulling us together. And of course, we can discuss um, how things are portrayed, how people talk and so forth. But, but as I said last year, and I, I really very often use that, that as an example, we would not have been willing to risk the lives of our soldiers if it wasn't for the fact that we were defending something that was bigger than ourselves. We, we are moving beyond our immediate self-interest. That's what alliances are about. That's why we sacrifice. We wouldn't have done that if this was only a, I was a random scramble of countries doing something together to save money. Mm. It's so much more than that. And that has been upheld for 70 years. And I see that being really as strong now as it was. Thank you. I have another one here. Um, may we expect a competition among NATO allies to strengthen bilateral ties to the U.S. if the U.S. disengages from the alliance? Well, first, I don't think the U.S. will disengage from the alliance. I, I, think, that's a, that. yeah. <laughs> I think that's a very important premise to make. Uh, but having said that, we, I mean, we have always been doing this along two tracks. We, we are contributing solidly into NATO when it comes to everything from, yep. from funding to reform. But we have also, I, as long as I think uh, our countries have existed, we've been also fostering a very strong bilateral tie to the U.S., as do every other country. Uh, and if anything... Uh, what I am experiencing over the past years is that that tie, of uh, those ties have been even stronger. The engagement from the U.S. side in everything from our 
assessments of Russia uh, to taking part with the marine, <coughs> sorry, with the marines uh, training and exercising here uh, is very strong, and that is something that we uh, appreciate strongly, and we don't take the U.S. for granted in any way. At the same time, we started in the beginning of 2014 to set out a course, and that was, and I underline again, before Trump, but we set out the course to strengthen our bilateral ties also with, with certain European countries, like Germany, like France, like the UK, and that will continue also after Brexit, I have to say, mm -hmm. very importantly, and the Netherlands, as, as four examples, because we have a lot in common with these countries, and we see that we also operate a lot uh, together, which means that we have a potential for, for doing more together. Not at the expense of the alliance at all, uh, but I think it has contributed to, to strengthening also uh, the alliance and initiatives that we've been taking. But I, I would also, uh, in closing, as I did at the outset, argue the premise that the U.S. is, is leaving the alliance. I can but yes, agree. Price. I can but agree, and uh, I don't have anything to add to Ina's comments. Yeah. But, but still we see a U.S. president that has somehow invented a new concept of transactionalism. who wants to engage bilateral with uh, different allies and countries, also inside the European Union, both on trade but also on security. Um, is this just... Um, uh, his uh, rather unconventional style, or is it more structural what we are seeing in the changes of uh, dealing with the European allies? Well, I'll say um, that it's important to look at different actors in the American system, and clearly President Trump has a unique style. Uh, we see it from NATO headquarters of, as having been very, very valuable in pushing uh, certain messages, including on burden sharing. Mm -hmm. Very valuable. But, you know, President Trump himself, Secretary General, was uh, just in Washington uh, a week ago, uh, and Secretary General heard, you know, directly um, from uh, the new acting uh, Secretary of Defense as well as the National Security Advisor. And then there was a lot of attention to, to President uh, Trump's uh, uh, public statements of support for NATO at that time. He said, we are 100% and I am 100% behind NATO. So he has, I think, uh, felt that he has been able to, uh, to push the alliance on burden sharing and that's been, that's been a good thing from, from the perspective of his, his goals in office. But I would also ask you to consider more widely the American body politic. Mm -hmm. uh, just in the last week uh, to 10 days, there have been uh, important pieces of legislation that have been introduced in the Congress, Senate and House sides on a bipartisan basis, very strong support for NATO. I think that's good. And the latest uh, surveys that have come out have shown 74% of the American public is supporting NATO. I have to tell you, when I was uh, contemplating taking this job in 2016, I went around Washington to talk to colleagues about uh, what I should expect, what would be my greatest challenges uh, at NATO headquarters, et cetera, et cetera. It may surprise you to learn that was at the end of the Obama administration, but when I was speaking to colleagues, both in and out of government, they said to me, your greatest challenge will be attention span that Washington's not paying that much attention to NATO and NATO headquarters because uh, of uh, challenges in other part of the world. So you're going to have an attention span problem. That will be your greatest challenge. Believe me, I do not have an attention span problem in Washington. <laughs> and I welcome that. I welcome the fact that Washington is now fully engaged from the Oval Office, the president himself, through the Congress to the American public. That is valuable and it bespeaks, I think, a very strong uh, interest and strong commitment of the United States to the NATO alliance. Mm. And let me just add yes, one please. thing to that. Um, I, f I fully agree with Rose and I think it's important to look at the institutions as such also and, and where the support lies. But I just read um, in my uh, background notes uh, going into the Munich Security Conference that comes up next weekend on the 15th and 14th and 15th of, of February. Um, as, it, as it seems now, it will be a record large American delegation. Um, yes, that's true. I think it was around 45 people mm -hmm. or something. It, it's just, it has never been that much before. That also says something about engagement and commitment that I think we should listen to. Mm. 
And as I normally say, follow the money. They spend more money in Europe now than they yeah, did but before. That, that is an interesting point. I mean, so. I mean, despite what you could read out of, of, I mean, only the kind of the, the discussion that goes between uh, Twitter feeds and, and all of that, you could easily get the impression that the U.S. Retra is retracting from Europe. But that's not the case. On the contrary, Congress has upped the spending mm -hmm. for the European Deterrence Initiative quite substantially. Uh, which, of course, is to the benefit of, of European security, but it, is, it runs contrary to the impression that you get very easily only from, from mm. watching social media. Thank you. And here is a question uh, to you, uh, Foreign Minister. We are uh, in a campaign for a permanent seat in the Security Council. And someone asks, uh, a membership in the Security Council is said to be a unique opportunity to influence international politics. However, for a small state such as Norway, how likely is it that anyone would listen to our suggestions? Will anyone pay attention to a small state's wo voice in a power political organ like the Security Council? Is this from someone in the ministry? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe someone because it, in your <laughs> because it provided because it provided a very good opportunity to say something about uh, small states in in the Security Please. Council. Um, because I I think on the contrary that what we have seen over the past years is that the elected ten members, small and big states, take a more prominent role uh, in the discussions than they used to do before. Um, it is not only about the permanent five. And as the permanent five in a consensus organ is not able to agree on things, uh, the elected members and having alliances on the outside of the Security Council has been working more constructively and interestingly enough, been able to push things through the Security Council that one didn't expect. And there are some uh, quite remarkable results from the Swedish term that they used their influence and, and ways of working to be an effective small state in quite a big system where you have five veto powers that can actually say no to most things, and, and that did also. Look at Syria, for instance. I mean, I think Russia now has vetoed, I think it is almost uh, 12 or 13 different resolutions on Syria. That has not to do with military intervention. It's about humanitarian access, it's about peace, and so forth. Chemical weapons. Chemical weapons, not to mention. Still, uh, especially Sweden, with the good help of others, managed to negotiate, for instance, the, the uh, humanitarian access issue that was very contagious and very difficult to do. So I think this is about the alliances you form. It is about how you play your role more than it is about your size as such. Uh, because if you are to, if you, if you have ambitions for for doing things, as we did the last time we were in the Security Council, now 20 years ago, it seemed to be, um, there are opportunities. Uh, and if you only sit back and think, well, we're a small country, we are just among the elected ten, you will not get anything done. Uh, our ambitions are, of course, much higher than that. <laughs> May I just say one quick thing on this? Yes. Um, to me, it seems, um, and forgive me to whoever asked the question, it seems somewhat of an absurd question because everybody knows the legacy of Norway in contributing over many years to significant international problems in my own field of nuclear arms control, but also in the Middle East, in the peace process, and, and so forth. So in any event, mm. uh, I do not doubt Norway, should it attain a seat on the Security Council, will have an enormous impact. But an interlinked question is that uh, with regard to security policy, what are the Norwegian, Norway's main priorities if we get the seat in the Security Council? Do we have any ideas on new initiatives? Well, <clears throat> it is um, two years' time from now if we uh, take a seat <laughs> in the Security Council. And the Security Council is, very, uh, is, is driven uh, by the events that take place at the time. Uh, the last time we were in the Security Council, no one actually thought about the idea of us chairing the Iraq Sanctions Committee because that was not on the agenda when we started discussing or, or thinking about becoming a member. But, on, but overall, I can say that for, for us, some important priorities will be to use the experience that we have in peace and reconciliation efforts in trying not only to 
participate in solving conflicts, but also preventing them from happening. Uh, and this is not only a Norwegian priority. We see that now we, we try to work with those who are in the Council right now and others uh, to have some continuity in this line of work. Secondly, it is in our core interest to uphold international law. And for our own security, that is also important. Uh, so to, to try to work contrary to those currents that are trying to erode international law and trying to erode the multilateral system is in itself an important priority when it comes to security. Because if anything that upholds, um, that upholds uh, global security, uh, what issues will be on the table, that is very difficult to say right now. But we are at the moment, for instance, chairing a expert group in the UN that I think has good potential. Uh, it is about verification of nuclear disarmament. Uh, that is maybe one of the most concrete and important initiatives that has been taken in that field for a long time. And uh, that will run um, through the year uh, and into the beginning of next year. And hopefully that can yield some results that can also be used as, uh, as an important factor in our Security Council term if we are to be elected. May I just pick up on that Thank for, for yes, a quick please. moment? Because um, I have to underscore how important uh, this effort has been, and it began some years ago with an experiment that Norway ran with the UK on how to uh, discern whether or not the front end of a missile is nuclear or conventional. And as I look, I talked about strategic patience with regard to INF, talking first about the stability challenges, but as I look to the long-term future, when we are able to bring the interested parties to the table for a negotiation, it's putting the N back in INF mm. that will be important. I believe, thanks to the work that Norway and partners have done with this initiative and other related initiatives internationally, I think we are getting to the point where we can discern nuclear from conventional warheads on the front of missiles in a way that is sympathetic to the security requirements of every country, so we could actually look to a future of banning nuclear-armed intermediate-range systems. We had to ban all systems, nuclear and conventional, in the late 1980s because we could not distinguish one from the other. And thanks to this work, it's making huge strides and will help us, I think, in future put the N back in INF. I have a long question on Ukraine here. I'm not going to read it. Uh, but I know last week you had a new meeting in the NATO Russia Council, mm -hmm. or the 25th of January, I guess. And uh, as always, since 2014, Ukraine has been the number one issue on that agenda. Uh, as well as now you had the INF treaty up for discussion. And I recall Stoltenberg saying that we are fundamentally disagreeing on both topics. Uh, the unfortunate situation in the Black Sea and the ongoing war in Ukraine, people dying every day. Uh, what is NATO thinking about it? What can you do? Is it any new ideas or is it just to sit and look at the war in Europe? Well, let me first emphasize that indeed, when we have our NATO-Russia Council meetings, we always uh, discuss uh, Ukraine uh, front and center, first item on our agenda, but I think more importantly, before we meet in that format of the NATO-Russia Council, we always meet together in the NATO-Ukraine Commission and talk about uh, what are the key issues for Ukraine, what do we really need to focus on. It was very helpful in scoping our discussion this time to focus on, uh, indeed, what has been happening in the Sea of Azov and Kerch Straits also what is happening with the human rights situation in the Donbass. And it's not only uh, the military uh, action there, which is indeed, uh, well, it has many of the, the signs and signals of a, of a hot war, but uh, very tragic and a large loss of life to military action. But what is also profound are the civilian 
the burdens on the civilian population, the mm. civilian casualties, and we were able to get a very good briefing on that from, uh, from the Ukrainian minister responsible for, for dealing with the civilian situation in the, in the Donbass and providing humanitarian aid, attempts to, to, to keep, uh, keep utilities up and running, all of those kinds of critical issues. It's become, I think, very important for NATO per se to understand the full weight of the problems that uh, the Russian Federation is imposing not only on Ukraine and challenging its territorial integrity and sovereignty, but on the populations there in that part uh, of the country, the Donbass and Crimea as well. So we expect this will be a topic during our defense ministerial in the coming, uh, coming days, a week from, from now. It will also continue uh, to be a topic uh, at our NATO uh, Council table on a day-in, day-out basis. Now, in terms of what we are doing, people frequently ask the question, are you going to be doing more in the Black Sea? I want to emphasize that we have already been doing a lot more in the Black Sea. Uh, from 2017 to 2018, we uh, went from 80 ship days in the Black Sea to 120 ship days in the Black Sea. We have, uh, we have three littoral states, Turkey, Bulgaria, and Romania, so they naturally have an interest in this, uh, in this matter. But we are flying uh, a lot of uh, reconnaissance flights in the area. Individual NATO countries, such as the UK and the US, have been bringing ships into the Black Sea over the last, uh, over the last couple of months uh, since the Sea of Azov incident. And we are doing a lot of training and exercising in that area. So I, I don't want to make it sound like it's anything new. There is a lot of NATO in the Black Sea already, but we will be looking for ways to continue to, uh, to work with our partners, not only with Ukraine, but I also want to stress with Georgia to uh, improve uh, their capabilities uh, in, uh, in that maritime environment and training and exercising will be an important, mm. important part of that. So um, NATO uh, is responding on behalf of its own uh, defense and secure, security requirements, but also working together with partners there. Mm. Thank you. I think it is important to remember what uh, is going on in Ukraine and, and at the contact line right now. I think it's um, sometimes easy to forget that we have a sometimes hot, sometimes cold war uh, in the middle of Europe. I, I went to the contact line when I visited Ukraine in September, and it was, it was quite staggering to see that you have an area of, that is quite small um, with 1.6 million internally displaced people. You have 3.5 million who are in need of humanitarian assistance. And you have people getting killed every day. Uh, some kilometers away from that, uh, we signed with the president present enormous contracts for Norwegian companies in renewable energy with the Ukrainian state. So it's a very mixed picture, but what is happening at the contact line is not going away. And if I can add one comment to the Sea of Azov and the Kerch Strait, I think one of the most interesting developments that happened there um, is that for the first time actually in this conflict, Russia used military force openly against Ukraine. It was not uh, disguised as it was up until now with unmarked uniforms, uh, denial of, of soldiers being present and so forth. It was open. And what that tells us is that it's also something that can potentially uh, take this conflict into a, into a new direction. Um, and I think it was, was an interesting point to, to see. And um, I also said to uh, Lavrov when I met him in, uh, in December that we, of course, uh, fully stand behind Ukraine's sovereignty and, and territorial integrity. But we also, uh, of course, demand the release of both the vessels and the crew that are still uh, now held, uh, held uh, prison. I'm sorry to tell you, we are running out of time. I have a lot of questions here regarding Turkey, China. We could take a tour around the globe <laughs> and sit here the and whole you day. Will for the next two days. But uh, I will just um, ask you in the end, how are you going to celebrate NATO's 70th anniversary? Please, uh, will it be champagne? Will it be <laughs> discussions? Well, the Americans are our hosts, so it's kind of up to them. But uh, 
I do assume we will have uh, a foreign minister. We'd be delighted to, uh, to welcome the foreign minister of Norway there. We'll have uh, a ceremony to celebrate, uh, to celebrate uh, the Washington Treaty, as I mentioned, and there will be some aspect <coughs> of that that is uh, involving perhaps some bubbly, but it will also be, I'm sure, a very, very serious discussion about the future of the alliance because we, uh, and I really uh, like uh, Foreign Minister Sarita's speech this morning because it pointed to the challenges of the future and what we need to do to grapple with them. So I thank you, Minister, for that. Thank you for coming. Okay. And I thank both of you. And I was very inspired by the small uh, history about uh, your um, you visiting Trident Juncture and that the people's hospitality in mid-Norway, knitting socks to all the soldiers. And of course, we have been knitting mittens to oh. you, oh. <laughs> visiting this cold Norway. Oh, thank Old you. Norwegian hand-knitted mittens. I hope you will enjoy that. <laughs> I will. Thank you very much. And you too. Oh. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you.